is the relationship between faith and reason? In the modern climate, these two are wrongly portrayed as being uh, in opposition to each other. That faith means believing in something for no reason. <laughs> And people who believe in the importance of reason and being reasonable should not accept anything unless it's proven by reason. Now, in Bhagavad Gita, see Krishna explains, Shatavan Labate Gyanam that person who is Shraddhavan, full of faith. Labate Gyanam, he attains transcendental knowledge. On the other hand, Krishna said, Sangshayatma Vinashati. That person who is full of Sangshay, full of doubts, he is lost, is destroyed, his life is ruined. Now, sunshine, doubt, or vikalpa, conceptualization, are functions of intelligence, buddhi. So it seems that one is, is, that one is saying that if your buddhi, your intelligence is functioning, and you have vikalpa, conceptualizations, and mm, sunshine, doubts, then you are ruined. So stop thinking. <laughs> Don't think. Don't use your intelligence at all. And then you'll be a very good cult member. Yeah. So, this is not the conclusion. It is said, First of all, what is a sort of faith? Faith means loyalty to God. That in everything you do, in your thoughts and your words and your deeds, you are loyal to God. You are not independent and separate uh, from Him in your interests or your objectives. So, uh, in the Amnaya Sutra, it is said, Sadha Tanyo Paya Vajam Bhaktan Mukhi Chitta Vritti Vishesh Sadha Faith is a special movement or disposition of the Chitta, of your consciousness, which is always inclined to service to God. Just like a faithful wife, is always serving her husband. If she's doing something else, she's considerably unfaithful. So a soul who is always serving God is called faithful. So that's Bhaktan Mokhi Chitta Vritta Vishayesh. And Sadhatu Anya Upai Varajam. That person has given up, relinquished all other methodologies or remedies to the problems of life, such as performing karma, reward-seeking activities. I will try to find happiness through seeking uh, material gain. Or jnana, I will try to become free from suffering just by uh, developing knowledge to get a type of liberation where I am free and whether God exists or not is not important as long as I am free. Any methodology, austerities, yoga, to develop mystic powers, all of these things, they've all been cast aside, they've all been abandoned in favor of loyalty to the Supreme Lord. I am his servant, let me serve him. This is Radha. Radha is loyalty to the Supreme Lord. 
So that is predicated on believing in God. And disloyalty is predicated on not believing in God. So if no one has any evidence for these things, both of these positions are a type of shraddha, a type of faith. Hmm? A loyalty to God or the faith that there is no God because you don't know. You are not omniscient. So, uh, Shraddha. Another definition of Shraddha faith. In Chaitanya Charamita, it is said, Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kohe Sudrida Nishchai Krishna Bhakti Kaile Sarvakama Kritamai. The word Shraddha, faith. Vishwas Kohe means Vishwas. Sudrida. Sudrida means extremely firm, not moving. And Vishwas means the conviction. You have an unflinching, unmoving conviction that simply by serving God, all other responsibilities have automatically been fulfilled. Because that is my only true and eternal metaphysical and moral obligation. That's why I exist. That is my Venus we're in France. Raison d'être. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that is a Vishva Sudritta, very firm conviction. Vishvas. Vishwas. The word the word Vishvas means uh, confidence or conviction. But in Sanskrit, swas means breath. What is it that makes you breathe? Your viswas, your special breath. That which animates you, which keeps you alive, which drives you in everything that you do is your viswas. Hmm? So that which is your breath, that which animates you, that which motivates you and drives you in everything that you do, if that is the conviction that Krishna is my all in all and I, my only success is in serving and pleasing Him, that is called Sraddha. Hmm? So, God, the existence of God, is a necessary truth. It is Tattva. Hmm? Krishna is Param Tattva. So God is a necessary truth. A necessary truth means that which you cannot deny without contradicting yourself. Hmm? Now one can say, no, I have so many arguments, I have so many reasons why there is no God. But you cannot establish any argument against God at all without contradicting yourself. You say, oh well, I've done it so many times without contradicting. No, you have contradicted yourself, but you didn't notice because you have cognitive failure. That is called Pramadda hmm? or Brahma. Hmm? It is said, conditioned souls, whatever they say, Hmm? is always defective because there are four defects. Brahm, Pramadda, Vipralipsa, and Karnapatav. Brahm, Pramadda, Vipralipsa, Karnapatav, Arsha, Vigya, Vakya, Nahi, Dosha, Ehisav. In Chaitanya Charita Amrita, Srila Krishna Skarabhaji Goswami Path said, the sayings, the words of the self-realized saints have no faults in them, have no defects in them. Because they themselves are not defective. They themselves are not afflicted with Brahm. Eh? That is the tendency to be in illusion. Pramada, the inability to understand the subject due to inattentiveness. Just not paying attention. <laughs> Falling asleep at the philosophical wheel. Eh? That is Pramada. 
viprolipsa. Viprolipsa means thinking in a particular way or speaking in a particular way, trying to establish a particular argument motivated by your own personal gain. It's a bias. Confirmation bias. You look around for a philosophy that confirms what you want. And in this way you cheat yourself. That is called vipralipsa. Srila Prabhupada calls it the cheating tendency. Hmm? The word uh, lipsa means for gain. So vipralipsa. Vishesh especially. Pra. Hmm? In, the, in, the very, in the most excellent way. <laughs> that means you are striving intensely in the best way you can to get stuff for yourself and you will not accept any philosophy <laughs> and you will not create any philosophy unless it offers you the prospect of worldly gain so that is called the cheating propensity or confirmation bias vipralips and lastly karnapatav Karnapatav means the defective senses. Our senses uh, are not perfect. And they don't give us a complete picture, though the world is real and we sense things which are there, but we sense them in a very limited and imperfect way. So all conditioned souls have these four defects. And because of this, whenever they try to deny the existence of the necessary truth. Tattwa. They cannot do it without contradicting themselves. Huh? But they don't notice. Why cognitive failure? Brahm Pramad. It tends to be in illusion and be inattentive. So, we'll now come to proof all of these things. Gradually. If you have any sunshine, any doubt. <laughs> now, faith, Sada, is on one side. Steady loyalty to God. And on the other side is sunshine, doubt. So because doubt is, let us say, detrimental to Shraddha. Hmm? Doubt Sangshai is detrimental to faith. And doubt is a function of buddhi, the material intelligence. So it seems that buddhi intelligence is detrimental to faith. Hmm? But this is not a fact. Only polluted intelligence is detrimental to faith. That intelligence which is afflicted with Brahm, Pramad, Vipra, Lipsa and Karnapata, these four defects, comes up with doubts and conceptions which are against the conclusions of scripture and the conclusions of faith due to cognitive failure. And if the intelligence, is, the buddhi is purified, then the uh, conceptualization will be favorable to faith. And uh, all sangshai will complete, completely go away. So this has been expressed by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his teachings to Srila Rupa Goswami and Srila Snart Goswami. Yeah. He explains that the Kanishta Adhikari, the neophyte spiritualist, the inexperienced spiritualist, who has not made much progress, that doesn't mean the spiritualist who has been practicing for a short time. You can also practice for a really long time and also not make much progress. Also possible. So that neophyte person, his Jahara Komala Srada Seikanistha John, his faith is soft. That means his faith, his loyalty to God keeps being interrupted. It is, that is called antara. It is interrupted by doubts. So his faith is not nirantara. Uninterrupted by doubts. His faith is interrupted by doubts. When he becomes more advanced and comes to the stage of nishta, steadiness, firm faith. Now Mahaprabhu describes him. He said, Shastra yukti nahi jani drida sradavan say madhyamadikari 
Say Mahabhagyavan. He's a fortunate person. He's a Madhyamadikari. His faith is firm, but he's not expert in Shastra Yukti. Shastra means the revelations of the scripture. And Yukti means reason. He hasn't been able yet to fully make his power of reason come in harmony with the statements of scripture. The fact that he's Madhyamadikari means that he's done it. Perhaps 80%. 85%. But he has not fully reconciled uh, the yukti, reason, with scripture, shastra yukti. Or he has not fully understood the shastra yukti, the reasoning of the scripture, the arguments of revelation itself. So who, who, who is the uttama adhikari? The highest level of qualification to begin sadhana bhakti. Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. This is discussing the levels of eligibility to practice Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. So when the devotee comes into the stage of Ruchi, that means the, the vritti of Bhakti, the vibration, the subtle waves of Bhakti have entered into his consciousness and Aprakrita, supernatural realization is appearing. So now this is the stage of Ruchi. If a little bit of ruchi will come, then all the tattvas uh, become understood. And one can understand perfectly the reasoning of the scripture. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Shastra Yukti Sunipun hmm? uh, Shastra Yukti Sunipun Dhrita Shadavan hmm? Dhrita Say Uttamadikari Jagatinista. Meaning is that that person who is Nipun, very expert in understanding the reasoning of the scriptures. In other words, his buddhi is not failing. He's free from, from Madda, inattentiveness, the inability to understand. His consciousness is purified and inspired. And therefore, he does not undergo cognitive failure when hearing or reading the scripture and reason and faith in scripture are in complete harmony for him. That is called the Uttamadikai. So, in conclusion, we can say that faith and reason are not two opposite things who are at war in each other. But when your buddhi, when your intelligence is contaminated, your reason isn't functioning correctly, and that's why there are things about revelation and about the scripture that you cannot yet understand, and you may reject due to one's own uh, defective perspective. Understand? Is it clear? Okay. Now, let's move on to some digest. <laughs> so let's move on to some pramanas from scripture that bring out all of these points that will mm, this is the arguments of scripture which are the uh, brahmagyan poshana brahmagyan poshana Brahmagyan means your knowledge of the Supreme Reality. So those arguments, that reasoning, which nourishes your understanding and realization of the Supreme Reality, is a Brahmagyan portion. Now, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, chapter 4, verse 31. Yat shaktayo vadatham badinam vai <laughs> Let me offer my respectful obeisances to the all-pervading Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, who possesses unlimited beautiful transcendental qualities, attributes, personality. 
It is the Supreme Lord's in the form of His expansion. Paramatma. Who is acting within the core of the heart of all philosophers who propagate various views because they are indifferent to Him by His external energy Maya. He makes them forget their own souls while sometimes agreeing with each other and sometimes disagreeing with each other. Mm -hmm. Thus he creates a situation within this material world in which they are unable to come to a conclusion. <laughs> what a verse. Beautiful. Vivar Sambhad. Argument and counter-argument. So, if you go to a university there, to the philosophy department, Mm. or more or less any department these days, you'll find lots of people, everyone arguing with each other. Mm. And no one comes to a conclusion. Mm. So, here in Srimad Bhagavatam it's described that when a person is indifferent to God, they turn away from God, then they become covered by avidya, Krishna's external potency, which covers your, it's Avarnatmik Shakti, covers your self-awareness that you're a soul, that you're not this body. And then after that, you identify with the body. And then from that point, whatever philosophy, whatever idea you come up with is always wrong and you cannot establish anything. Someone else will come along and cut your argument and someone will come along and cut his argument and someone will cut his argument. Hmm? When our Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a young boy, he was into studying Navya Nyai logic. And of course his pastime to go everywhere arguing and cutting each other's arguments. And he would just cut an argument, establish his own argument, then cut his own argument and establish another one. And then cut that and establish another one. And then cut that and establish the one that he started with. Like this. Yeah. Now, don't be confused. This is the play of Maya. So, uh, this is, and this is why in the modern day, uh, philosophy has become unpopular. Hmm? Right? Well, uh, philosophy is unpopular. I, I think even at school, in, in Europe, perhaps in America, they don't even teach it. Is the subject for anyone under the age of 16? When you go to university, you can choose it. But is it subject for anyone under the age of 16? Forget it. Forget it. Right? No, 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 no. This is, for years and years, it's not even there in the curriculum anywhere. Right? Philosophy has completely gone out of fashion, completely gone out of style. And the reason is, because persons whose minds are turned away from God come up with so many ideas, they, and they argue and refute each other, and it's inconclusive, so the common person is, so it's a complete waste of time, because you never come to any conclusion. And it has no practical application, and so gradually it's fallen out of uh, fashion. But this is, this was not true, uh, even even in Europe, up to the time of the Enlightenment, and for sometimes after the Enlightenment, it was understood that philosophy is a discipline that leads you to the wisdom of knowing what is the cause of all existence, and that cause is God. And by contemplating God you will find the supreme happiness. And there was a consensus about that. Not only in Christianity, but between Christian and Islam and Judaism and the ancient pagan philosophers also. They all had a complete consensus on this fact that philosophy is the search for the ultimate cause, God from whom everything has come. And the problems of life and the supreme happiness, are, the problems of life are solved and the supreme happiness is found by the contemplation and realization of that supreme truth. It was a complete consensus. But now we're living in a very dark age. Kali Yuga has progressed such that all the, the uh, dignity and the value of philosophy has been minimized completely in society. So, and the reason for that is explained here in the sixth canto of Shiva Bhagavatam. Yachakteo vadatam vadinam vai vivadasambhavu bhuvobhavanti. 
<clears throat> those who turn away from God, they are covered by illusion and they go into a state of pramada, inattentiveness, cognitive failure, where they can never come to the right conclusion, so they're always just refuting each other with no end. Now, there's another verse, Krishna also has said this, and this, is, uh, this is the verse here. Krishna is saying a similar thing here in the 11th canto in his teachings to Uddhav. And this is a very important verse. In fact, Srila Jiva Goswami Pad has uh, utilized this verse in the beginning of Bhakti Sandarbha to establish the necessity of devotion to Sri Krishna. The necessity. Why? Why is the Abhideya Tattva? Why is the process? Why is the methodology by which we attain perfection in life? Bhakti. And not some other path. Hmm? This is the reason. Atma parigyana mayo vivado. Atma means Supreme Lord here. Here Atma doesn't mean this Atma, it means Supreme Atma. Parigyan means proper knowledge. And here it is not Parigyan, it is Aparigyan. So Atma Aparigyan. Because of not having any proper knowledge or understanding of God, my own vivado, persons engage in a vivad. Hmm? That is the argument. And what kind of argument do they make? Yastiti nastiti. Asti means it is. Iti, iti means thus. And it's used like um, quotation marks in Sanskrit. Vasudeva saram iti. Bhaktosi me saka che iti. Vadanti tattva vidas tattvam yadgyana matriyam. Brahmeti. Paramatmeti, <laughs> Bhagavaniti, Shabjate. So iti means putting some quotation marks around something. So what do we put in the quotation marks around here? Asti and nasti. Nasti, iti. Asti, iti and nasti, iti. <laughs> so asti means it is. And na, na asti means it is not. In other words, when Persons compose their philosophy, their conception, their argument hmm? without any understanding of God. Then what do they do? Either they say, the world is real. That is the reality, not God. There's no God, just the physical world is real. Materialism or natural, what they call naturalism. Naturalism means, naturalism is totally unnatural by the way. <laughs> Naturalism means that there's nothing supernatural behind everything. So, naturalism, astiti, or nastiti, the world is not real. It's all an illusion. It's all in your mind. So, bedarta nishta, and uh, those persons, they have the focus of their discussion, material duality. They, they're discussing material dualities and they conclude either only the world is real and there's no spiritual element or they conclude that only consciousness is everything and the world is not real. Mm -hmm. uh, that's called uh, anti-realism, naturalism and anti-realism. So, Vyatopi even though their discussions, the world is real, there's no God, the world is an illusion. These discussions, Vyatopi means, although they are completely useless, because that's because they never come to a conclusion, they can refute each other. Vyatopi Naivoparameta these persons cannot give up quarreling. They can't stop because they're Bidata Nishta. They have Nishta. 
in crawling. <laughs> They're addicted. They're just, it's like a default mode. It's like a switch. If the switch is on guard, then you can come to a conclusion. Click. If you take the switch off guard, then you go into this default mode of just endless argument with no confusion. No conclusion and lots of confusion. <laughs> now, we have to open and open and open some, even though their arguments are all useless. They cannot give them up. Why? Mataha parabrita diam solokat. Because mata means from me, Krishna says. Paravrita diam. Their consciousness is turned away from me. Swalokat. And who am I? I am their very self. Just as our soul pervades this body, so the super soul, Paramatma, pervades our soul. That's why it's called Paramatma. Paramatma God is the soul of your soul. In Nyai, that which is uh, Vyapak, which pervades, that which is Vyapi pervade, Vyapi pervaded. That which, which is pervading is the cause, and that which is pervaded is the effect. So God is our cause and we are the effect. So when we turn away from God, not only do we lose the truth of God, we lose the truth of ourselves. There's no, you cannot know the truth of yourself without knowing the truth of God. Because you are related Atma and Paramatma as cause and effect. And cause and effect actually is there is the relationship of Beda Ved. A chincha ved inconceivable oneness and difference. Jivera Swarupoi Krishna Nitya Das. It is the Swarup, the nature of the Jiva to be Krishna's eternal servant. Krishna Tasta Shakti Ved Abhed Prakash. The soul is the manifestation of Krishna's Tatasta Shakti, which is one with and also distinct from him. So when we turn away from God, we lose God and ourselves. And then we're stuck in this default position of endless speculation. And it's not that philosophy is bad, it's just that you become a bad philosopher. <laughs> because you have cognitive failure. Pramatta. Falling asleep at the philosophical wheel. Cognitive failure. That's it. So, now, just to give just a little background here for those, anyone in the audience who studied philosophy? Actually, he's a, he's a philosophy teacher right here. <laughs> Let me say an unemployed philosophy teacher. <laughs> because it's Kali Yuga. In a previous age, you would just have a big long line of students all queuing up to get his mercy. Right? But now I'm Kali Yuga. Who cares? Huh? So, anyway, for the those who study philosophy a little bit, we can look. The, 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 the mind is fluctuating this way and that way. And even the person who today is giving arguments saying, Hyastiti, the world, there's no God, only the world is real. Hmm? Even the consciousness is not real. The consciousness is just a product of the brain. Hmm? That person, after so many years, will change his mind and go to the other side. And those who are on the other side, after so many years, they go to the other side. If you study the history of philosophers, so many of them change their mind when they're really old. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the ones that don't believe in God. The ones, that don't be the ones that believe in God don't change their mind generally. The ones that don't believe in God, when they get old, they change their mind and believe in God. Mm -hmm. And the ones that don't believe in God, that at the end also don't believe in God, they just change their mind about everything they said in their life and contradict everything that they said. You can, you can see. Yeah. So, Russian philosopher um, Vladimir Soloviev, he wrote a book called The Crisis in Western Philosophy. And he was just pointing out how since everyone turned away from God, so many philosophers came and and the academia just was swinging one from one side to the other. 
only the world is real, there's no soul and no God, and then a few years later it becomes only consciousness is real and the world is an illusion. So, in the school of, of naturalism, Asti, you have uh, David Hume, Charles Darwin, and then in modern times Daniel Dennett and John Searle. Uh, and on the other side, anti-realism, from the time of the Enlightenment, Kant, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Hegel, and in modern times, Sam Harris. So you can see on a, ma on, a ma on a micro scale, an individual, his mind is unsteady and his philosophy is changing in life. And on a macro scale with the whole world, you can see the currents of history. It's just the, kind of, not exactly the collective mind, but all minds of many people together socializing with each other, also just swinging from one wrong argument to another. So this, this is a very astonishing, profound verse spoken by Sri Krishna to Uddhav. Uh, so, now, now I want to come to this famous sutra of Vedanta Sutra. Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. So all the and also 
Buddhism, materialism, mm, that is the Javakamuni's philosophy, and Jainism. So all of these uh, either Astic philosophers who believe in the Vedas and Gnostic philosophers who don't believe in the Vedas, they all have a, they don't really understand the conclusion and so their arguments are all refuted in chapter 2 of uh, Vedanta. So this is a very important sutra of Vedanta and I'm sure you've all heard the first word of this sutra many, many times. It's very famous. Usually people don't learn the whole sutra. Usually they just learn the first the first two words which are joined together. Taga Patishtanad. So Taga Patishtanad. Apyanyata Numayam Iti Chet Evam. Apyanyata Moksha Prasangaha. So there are I've seen many translations of this, they're usually not very correct. So we've got, we're going to go through the sutra step by step. A sutra is a very short aphorism which contains a great deal of knowledge. And so what you have here, even though this sutra, for example, is just one line, but it has three different people speaking. First one person speaks, then the next person refutes him, then the next person comes and refutes him, all in one line. <laughs> so let's see what's being said here. Because this will clear our Gaudiya Vaishnav, Gaudiya Vedanta perspective on the subject of faith and reason. So, Tarka Tarka means logic or reason, argument, race your nation. Apatistanat means, Pratista means established. So if you can establish an argument, that means you've come to a conclusion. So Apatista means not conclusive. So Tarka Apatistanat means, oh, because logic or reason is not conclusive. And the context is, in this chapter, they're discussing what is the upadan karan, the ingredient cause of existence. This is the speciality between Vaishnavism, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, Vedanta, and all the other Nyai, Vaisheshik, Sankhya, everything. For the world to exist, there has to be something that it's made out of. Hmm? That's called Upad and Karan, the ingredient cause. And there must be someone who gets that ingredient and makes it into the form that it is. Hmm? So in, in Greek philosophy, uh, that would be prime, prime matter, pure potential, is the ingredient cause. And we call that Pradhan. So the Pradhan, and then there should be a Nimitta Karan. Nimitta Karan means the instrumental cause, that which actualizes the potential to make the forms of the world. Hmm? So, generally, the ph uh, philosophers in Nyai, in logic, they accept God. In Vaisheshik, they accept God also. But they say that God is the Nimitta Karan, He's the instrumental cause. He makes the world. But what he makes it from is something else. But the difference between them and the Vedanta is that God is not only the Nimitta Karan. He's also the Upadan Karan. He's the ingredient cause. Because our philosophy is Advaya Gyan Paratattva. Non-dual reality. There is nothing separate from God. God is not like the... They give the example of the old watchmaker who makes a watch, winds it up, puts it on the shelf and goes. Hmm? The absentee father. Right? Where's God? Oh, he made the world and then he went somewhere. Who knows where he is? <laughs> I wish he'd come back and fix everything. Huh? No. The philosophy of the Vedas is that God is the Nimitta Karan, the 
the instrument, of course, and also the ingredient. So, how can we establish this? So, in answer to that, the first person is saying, Taka Patishtanat, logic is inconclusive. By reason, you can't establish anything. So, we must simply just accept the statements of the Sruti, the statements of the Vedas, in regard to Brahman being the ingredient cause of the world. End of story. Yeah? So then, the next part of the sutra, oh, before we go on to the next part of the sutra, we'll just give some evidence to support that first, the first person who's speaking in this sutra. Um, and this is actually quoted by Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And I believe it's a verse from Vakyapadiya by Bratri Hari. It's quoted in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Yatnena padito pyata kushala anumatridi abhi yukta tarer anyar anyatai vopad padyate. A person who is more skillful at arguing can bring about a conclusion different from what has been carefully proven previously by another skillful logician. In other words, one who is brilliantly very talented intellectual gives his masterpiece, his thesis, and he thinks, oh, I've solved everything. And then someone who has more intelligence, more brilliant, will come along and just completely refute it and show how it's full of faults and contradictions. Okay. So, now, the second part of the sutra here. Api anyata anumayam iti ched means api no. We don't accept that logic is inconclusive. Why? Anyata anumayam. Because it's possible to prove the opposite. In other words, you can prove that lo logic is conclusive. And that Brahman is not the ingredient cause of the world. Therefore, means, therefore, the second person is saying, you're wrong. You said that logic has no, it's inconclusive, you can't come to any conclusion or establish anything. The second person is saying, no, some logic is inconclusive, but some logic is conclusive. It's not all inconclusive, there's something which is conclusive. And not only that, but by that conclusive knowledge, one can establish that the Vedanta is wrong. Hmm? And you can prove that uh, Brahman is not the ingredient cause of the world. That is called Brahma Samavai. That, the, that the God is inseparable uh, from, the, um, from the world as the ingredient cause. Okay. Now, what is the second person saying? The second person is saying, look, if you say that there's no logic which cannot be refuted, sorry, say, you say, if someone presents an idea, and you say that no one can present an idea which will stand, everyone's idea will fall down, then we say that this is wrong. Why? Because the argument that made it fall down, that refuted it, would be right. You got it? Someone presents an argument, you say, look, no argument can be right. But you're contradicting yourself, because if someone puts an argument, and someone comes and proves that it's wrong, they were right that it was wrong. Okay? Did you get that? Everyone's got that, or do I have to say it again? If you say that no argument can stand, then you are wrong. 
because if no argument can stand, then some argument must come along and take it away. So the argument that took it away established that it was wrong. So an argument stands. So I'm just, this is just an example. We're discussing how when you deny God, you can't say anything hmm, which doesn't contradict itself. But you don't recognize that because you had a cognitive failure. So the person who said, Dhaka Pratishtana, no argument can establish anything. Thought he was right about that, but he was completely contradicting himself. Hmm? Because if any argument comes along and, and destroys that, then in order to destroy it, it must be right about that that's wrong. So, Dhaka Pratishtana is not correct. We don't accept it. So then, Another thing is, if you say, Taka Pratishtanat, no argument can stand, then when someone challenges you, you can't defeat him. Right? So how many contradictions are in this statement? Taka Pratishtanat, logic has no conclusion. Hmm? Did you see it? Did you see it or did you have cognitive failure? <laughs> exactly. Huh? You heard, ah, yeah, yeah. No logic, that you can come to a conclusion because one person refutes another. Yeah, yeah, that may, it makes sense. Like that. But it completely makes no sense whatsoever. You just had <laughs> cognitive failure. And you didn't even notice. So it's a, it's a, it's a performative point. So then in the commentaries, they're giving um, some example is given. You look in the distance and you see a mountain. On the mountain, there's some smoke. So then you think, there's a fire on that mountain. Hmm? You can't see fire because you see the smoke rising up on the mountain in the distance. So then you conclude, there's a fire on the mountain. Why? Dumovani vyabena. Because smoke is pervaded by fire. And the fire is the cause of the smoke, so there must be smoke on the mountain. Okay? So then, a person has a doubt. Is there fire on the mountain or not? So, in order to prove that there's a fire on the mountain, then you have to establish that there's an invariable and unconditional concomitance between fire and smoke. In other words, where there's fire, there's smoke. Or where there's smoke, there's fire. And this relationship between the two is invariable and unconditional. You have to prove that. So, if you have a doubt whether there's uh, fire on the mountain, if you can prove that fire and, and smoke, that fire is the cause of smoke, and there is an invariable and unconditional concomitance between the two, then your doubt goes away. Your doubt goes away. So, if by logic you can remove a doubt, then we cannot say Taka Pratishtanat. You cannot say logic has no conclusion because you use it every day to remove your doubts. Right? So, the second person in the, in the Sutra, he's saying, Apyanyata Anumayam Iti. You cannot say logic is without conclusion. Apyanyata Anumayam. You cannot say this. Why? Because first, you've already contradicted yourself in so many ways that we've already pointed out. And secondly, the whole world could not go on. Because at every moment, we are making choices which are based on our experience in the past and the present. And by basing our choices on experience in the past and in the present, we make our choices and we predict what will happen in the future. In other words, I did this thing before and I suffered like anything. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I did this thing before and I was happy. I'm going to do that. And then you do that and you get the same result. And so on. So in every, in every moment, the human being's mind is functioning and using logic, coming to conclusions, and they're also correct. Right? Okay, so... Therefore, we can say that some logic is inconclusive, and, but some logic is 
conclusive. Now the second uh, person who is argument arguing is saying, and by that reason, which is conclusive, we can establish mm, an opinion which opposes Vedanta, the idea that God is the ingredient cause of everything, that He's present in everything. This is the uh, this is the second person's speech. Okay. So now the third person is replying. And this is Vyasadev, he's giving the conclusion. Third person is replying, Avam Api. He says, Avam, in this way. That means if we accept the argument of the previous person, that reason is conclusive, and by reason you can prove that God is not the ingredient cause. Then Anir Moksha Prasangaha. Moksha, liberation, will become unattainable. He said, we reject your conclusion of the second person, because if we accept that conclusion, Mukti, your liberation, will be unattainable. Hmm? Now, you can understand why Vedanta Sutra requires commentaries. <laughs> right? Each sutra is so deep. Uh, and in, in fact, in, in, uh, in the Vedic culture, you're not, a, a Sampradaya is not even accepted to be an authorized Sampradaya unless they have a very thorough commentary on Vedanta. Okay, so, Ani Moksha Prasangaha, we don't accept the previous argument because liberation will become unattainable. No one will, no soul will ever be freed from the suffering of the material world if we accept the previous explanation. Okay, what does that mean? If a person wants to attain the goal of life, attain liberation, they'll have to have a very steady mind. Mm -hmm. So, if the mind is unsteady, they cannot do sadhana. And they will not be able to attain liberation. They will have so many doubts. interpret the world is because the world makes sense. The world functions in a regular way according to mm, there's a reason in the world. There's a, there's a regular way in which the world functions. Uh, people call that the laws of nature. Mm? But really they're the laws of God. And really those laws are just God's conventions. It's whatever He wants it to be. So God wants the world to be in a particular way, so it, it functions in an, expected, uh, in an expected way. Now, because God Himself is the cause of all those regularities, and because God Himself is beyond cause and effect, He's not subject to the laws of cause and effect. Is it clear? Logically, we can say that. Because he's the cause of everything. He makes everything happen in a particular way. So we can predict how things will happen. But he himself, who has set up those cause and effects according to his own convention, himself, he's not bound by any cause and effect. And because he's not bound by cause and effect, we cannot predict what he'll be like. Right? Understand? We predict the way the world will unfold because it has particular patterns of cause and effect. But because God is beyond cause and effect, therefore it is logical that logic does not function, has no jurisdiction in the realm of Brahman, in the realm, realm of the Supreme Truth. So when people demand that, oh, you have to explain why is God a blue boy who plays a flute? <laughs> No, you don't. And they say, well, you're, you're illogical. Say, no, 
you are illogical. Because you can, logic is only applicable to that realm which uh, behaves in an orderly way according to cause and effect by which we can predict it. But by very definition, God is Sarva Karana Karanam, the cause of all causes. He's not limited by any cause and effect, and therefore the power of reason to predict him must, by logically, you must conclude that it fails in that realm. And this is the meaning of, in the commentary, Baladeva Dibhushan, who has written our Gaudiya commentary on Vedanta Sutra, the Govinda Basya. You know, because, um, you know what happened in Jaipur? Their deities, uh, Rupa Goswami is Radha Govinda. So some scholars from the Sri Sampradaya, they came and they told the king, this Radharani is not married to Krishna. Hmm? Krishna is married to Rukmini. Why are you worshipping Krishna and the unmarried woman? <laughs> This is not this is not Dharma, this is not bona fide. And they uh, by force they persuaded him that Radharani should be taken away from Govinda. This is external reason, the real reason was that Radharani was in man and she ran away from Krishna because of his naughty behavior. But outwardly, historically, this is what happened. So then the king, who was uh, was uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava but could not argue with them. He sent a message. His family had been the followers of uh, Rupa Goswami for some generations. They sent a message. He sent a message to Vrindavan to Srila Vishnu Chakri Thakur. Please come and establish the truth, whereby the worship of Radha Krishna is supreme. Vishnu Chakri Thakur was very old at that time, so he did not go. He did not want to leave Vrindavan, but he sent his Shiksha disciple. Srila Baladeva Dibhushan. Oh, he will go and represent me. So Baladeva Dibhushan uh, Prabhu went there to Jaipur and he established Radha Tattva and the eternality of the, uh, the Radha Krishna as the supreme Purna Shakti and Purna Shakti Man. But those scholars said, you Gaudias don't have a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So we cannot accept you as an authorized Sampradaya. So then, well, David Dibhushan, he said, just give me a few days and I'll write a commentary. I'll give you a commentary, not that I'll write it, I'll give you a commentary. Then he went to Govinda Dev and prayed, oh Govinda Dev, please. <laughs> <laughs> Be merciful to me and I will help you. And Govinda Dev said, yes, anything to get my Radharani back. <laughs> So in order to get Radharani back, then Govinda Dev inspired in the heart of Baladeva devotion the Govinda Basya, the commentary on Vedanta Susodhis. This is the commentary. So he is quoting a verse from the Kata Upanishad. One, two, nine. Naisha Tarkena Mati Apaniya. So this is a very beautiful story from the Kata Upanishad. You know, perhaps you've heard this story before. I have told it many times. The uh, great disciple Najiketa. Najiketa, and he went to study uh, in, uh, under his guru Yamaraj. You remember? Yeah. I've told this many times, very important uh, history illustrating the relationship between Satsisya, a bona fide disciple, and Sadhguru, Vedagya, Tattvakya Guru, spiritual master who has realization of the truth. So, Yamaraj here is speaking, he says, O oh, Prashta, oh my dear, dear beloved disciple, with great affection, O oh, Nachiketa. Hmm? The pragya, that means the mati, the buddhi, the, the consciousness, the intelligence, the thoughts by which the Brahma Tattva is attained or experienced are appropriate. So all reason is not rejected on the spiritual path, but the reasoning which comes from scripture which nourishes our understanding and helps us attain God, is accepted. O 
Sanketa, this Pragya, this consciousness that you have developed, by which Brahmatattva is experienced, is appropriate. Do not join it, do not amalgamate it with the Shushka Tarka, with dry reasoning. Dry reasoning means just speculation. Not based on scripture, not heard from Sri Guru. Because it, the mind we discussed is defective and only produces, by dry reasoning, only it produces faulty conclusions. So don't mix this with Shushka Tarka. <clears throat> only by being instructed by a Vedakya Guru, a spiritual master who has realization of the truth. <clears throat> then you accept this presentation, this logic, this argument which is favorable for realization and this, by following this in your life, gradually you will have realization of the Bharatattva. Okay. So then Baladeva Jibhushan quotes a verse from the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, spoken by Lord Brahma to Narada Muni. Canto 2, chapter 6, text 41. munayaha Prashanta Mendriya Shayaha Yadata Neva Sattar Gais Tiro Dieta Viplutam. Hmm? The meaning is the Supreme Truth is Vishuddha, completely pure. Purana, complete and perfect. Anadi with no beginning, Anantam with the out end. It is Nirgun, not touched by. Sattva, Rajas and Tamas of this world. Now, your mind is the transformation of ego. Ego is already tamasic. Ego means the Mahatattva touched by Tamagun makes Ahankar. And the part of the Ahankar which is little, somewhat more Sattvic is the mind and the part of the Ahankar which is somewhat more Rajasic is the Buddhi. Hmm? And the senses. This is how they the subtle body comes about. But God is Nirgun. So how can that God who is Nirgun be understood by the mind which is a product of three gunas? Nityam, Supreme Lord is eternal. Advayam, non-do. Now, Vashayva Danti Munaya Prasantat Mendraya Shaya That Supreme Lord can be described he is described by the rishis, Prashanta Mendriyashaya, whose senses, whose mind and whose chitta is Prashanta in a state of peace and equilibrium. In other words, when the chitta becomes steady, it has a quality called Swachattva, clarity. Like a mirror. And when the, that person is chanting the holy name and engaged in devotion to the Supreme Lord, the actual Nirgun, transcendental form of God, is reflected in that swat, the Swatcha, the pure Chitta. This is how realization of God comes. Now, what happens when you engage in, here it is said, Asat Tark. Asat means material Tarka argument and logic. So, because material argument and logic is a product of Rajagun, it's like a wave, a turbulence in the chitta. Now, just imagine, if there's a reflection of you in still water, what happens if someone throws a stone in the water? Then, your reflection disappears. So here, this is actually Lord Brahma instructing his disciple Narad Muni. He says, Risheva Danti Munaya Prasantat Bendriyashaya the sages describe the Supreme Lord when their hearts are in a state of complete peacefulness, their minds and senses are steady. Hmm? But yada, when tadeva sattarakais, a person engages in mundane logic, then what happens? That means the chitta has now become turbulent, tiro dieta viplutam, and the vision of God disappears. So, and, and, and that is really an explanation of the, of the verse we're just uh, describing from the Kanto Panishad, where Yamaraj is saying, oh, now you have realization, don't destroy it by reason. 
You came in the state of samadhi, trance. You have the vision of God. Now don't lose it by these chitta vrittis, disturbance of the, of, of the mind, asatarka, mundane reason. Okay. Now, how long can we go on for? I think it's okay because only the people that should go... That, I'm in an empty room. There's just me and you here. Cameras should all face this way only, because this is an empty room. Just saying, for all everyone who's watching on Facebook. <laughs> so we can go on a little. Okay. Now, however, we should understand that the re reasoning which is Brahma. Brahmagyan Poshana, nourishing. So that is Shastra Yukti, the reasoning of the scriptures. How Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains to Sanatana Goswami, to Rupa Goswami, how Ramananda Rai explains to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it's not unreasonable. Hmm? So the reasoning of the scriptures is nourishing. And, and that is always, uh, the reasoning of the scriptures is acceptable. And, and our reasoning which is called Shastra Sammat. Sammat means in agreement. If your reasoning is Shastra Sammat, in agreement with the scripture, it's acceptable. So, Bhagavad devotion is giving some evidence for that. In the Manu Smriti, there, Manu says in Manu Smriti 12.106, there are three types of Praman evidence. Pratyaksh, Anuman and Sruti. Pratyaksh means direct perception. Anuman means inference or logic reason. And Shastra, Shruti, the Vedas. So, Manu is saying, as the Shruti, the Vedas, is the highest authority in matters of Dharma, religious law, it is also the only authority in theological matters, in Brahman, understanding Brahman. So, for example, how can you know what is Dharma? Just imagine you're just a group of people in the jungle somewhere, you just appeared, and you want to make civilization. How do you know how to do it? You don't have a clue. Right? The only way you can know Dharma is God reveals Dharma. Dharma to Sakshat Bhagavad Pranitam. Dharma has come from the breathing of the Lord. Tasmat Shastra Pramanam Te Kari Karya Vyavastita Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita To know what is to be done and what is not to be done the only proof is scripture. So the scripture said okay people let's get organized. Young ones you're going to be brahmacharis. Celibate students when you've completed your education then you have to be grihastas householders and you will have duties as grihastas and then after that you can be Vanaprastha, retire, and in the end, some may take sannyas, the renounced order. This is how we'll organize the uh, structure for the psychological development of the individual. And for the development of society, some of you are going to be brahmanas, those who are in the mode of goodness. And brahmanas have their duties to teach the Vedas, to study the Vedas, to perform sacrifice, to engage others in sacrifice, to receive charity and distribute charity. So these are six... Uh, duties of, of the, the Brahmanas. The Kattriyas, some of you will be warriors and you will protect the people under the guidance of the Brahmanas. And some will be Vaishas, um, that means cow protection, farming and commerce, banking. And you have your duties, you have to supply everything for the Sutras. Don't give them money, they'll spend it on beer and cigarettes. <laughs> so you just you earn the money and you give them everything they need to be happy. Yeah? And the sutras, they have to serve everyone else. So this is dharma, how society is organized. How you know what to do? Unless God will reveal it to you. Just like now in society, everyone's trying to come up with the best society and it's just one revolution after another and everyone killing each other. Right? Communism, capitalism, socialism, Marxism, whatever, one thing after another. Like this, chaos. Because it's not scientific. Srila Prabhupada said, Western society looks very successful now, he said in the 60s. 
He said, but because it's not scientific, it's not going to last. I fall apart. And, and here we are, 50 years later. <laughs> and just give it another 50 years and see. What Prabhupada said is true. Because everyone was just living off the fumes of their ancestors' piety. Their ancestors worshipped God. And that's what caused the, the organization, the society. And everyone for the last century was just living off the fumes of their ancestors' piety. Those fumes have run out now. So we have a civilizational collapse. So, Manu here is saying that there are three ways to understand things. Perception, inference, that is Prateksh, Anuman, and Shruti, the Vedas. In, just as the Shruti, the Vedas, are the highest authority in the matters of Dharma, duty, so they are also the highest authority in matters, theological matters, what is Parabrahma as well. But just because they are the highest authority doesn't mean that perception and reason are useless. They are accepted when they are Shastra Sammat. That means in agreement with the Shastra. Hmm? And if they're not in agreement with the Shastra, why do we reject them? Because they're part of the practical cognitive failure. Because if you're not attentive to God, then you have the grossification of the intelligence that makes you susceptible to cognitive failure. Pramadda, Brahma, Pramadvi, Balibs, Pranapada. Just testing to see if you remember the beginning part of the lecture. Now, Okay, so I'm just coming to the last, the last uh, praman here given by Baladeva Dibhushan. It's a, an incredible commentary. Krishna was so fired up, he wanted to inspire Baladeva Dibhushan to write that commentary. <laughs> you know what that means, he could get around around back, so. <laughs> now, now it's been established that the Shruti, the Vedas, are the supreme authority, but, but reason, which is Shastra Sammat, in agreement with that, is always acceptable. And let's have some praman for that. So now, Baladeva Dibhushan Prabhu is giving a quotation also from the Upanishads, spoken by Yagyavalka Rishi to Maitreyi, Maitrey, his wife. So, Yagyavalka Rishi, this is a very famous Upanishadic saying Atma va are drastavya srotavyo mantavyo nididyasitavyo. O my tray, it is the Atma, Atma, that is supreme truth, God, who is drastavya. Drastavya means uh, see, drastavya means it is to be seen. That's what you have to do. What do you have to do in life? In your life you have to see God. That's what you have to do. That's your duty. You have no other duty. There's nothing else to do. If you're successful in that, your life is successful. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter how successful you were. All those successes were a grand failure. Atma vai drastabya, srotabhyo. Srotabhyo means you have to hear about Krishna. You must hear about God. Mantavyo. Mantavyo means you must deliberate. You must think hmm? about Krishna. Nididyasitabhyo. Hmm? And you must search for him. Nididyasitavyo means through meditation. So, here, Baladeva Dibhushan Prabhu is quoting this uh, verse from the Upanishads because of the word mantabhyaha. You must, you must think about God. So that shows that thinking is not forbidden in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Philosophy and thinking is not, you must do it. But it should be Shastra Sambat in accordance with the scripture. And that's not because uh, we're trying to oppress you in any way. It's because if, you, if your consciousness turns away from God, then the avidya comes, 
the buddhi undergoes grossification and becomes afflicted with Brahm, Brahmada, Vipalipsa, etc. So how that happens, how the intelligence fails, one comes under the grip of cognitive failure and comes to wrong conclusions, how the buddhi congeals, it undergoes grossification and turns into this Brahm and Brahmada, will explain exactly tomorrow. <laughs> Don't have the pudding, the dessert first. Dessert is last. <laughs> Sukta, that is the neem leaves and karela, bitter melon, you have to eat that first to increase the digestion. Then when the, when the, when the dessert comes, it's, you can digest it and you'll not get diabetes. <laughs> so, the rasamahal, Palace of Rasa is built on the foundation of Siddhanta. So by this, by Vedanta, by Siddhanta, you have a strong foundation. You can build Rasa Mahal, the Palace of Rasa, and in that Palace of Rasa, Radha Krishna will live. But, if you don't build this foundation, and you try to build a Rasa Mahal, first of all, Radha Krishna will not come and live there. Because they'll be afraid that this whole ceiling will fall down. Because there's no foundation. So Srila Krishna Skaraj Goswami said, Siddhanta Bili Arjiti Nakura Alas. Jahoite Krishna Lagi Sudhidamanas. When it comes to understanding Siddhanta, don't be lazy. By understanding Siddhanta, your mind will become steady and fixed on Krishna. And in the steady mind, what happens? Svachattvam Rikaritvam Santattam Mitichetasa Bhagavad Bimba Garhitva Your mind develops the capacity to catch the reflection of the beautiful form of Shamsundar. 